It's evening on the underground. You're a 57-year-old man, or maybe you're a woman. It doesn't matter. It's really about a time of life more than anything else. You've done all right. The house paid off, the old long days in the office replaced by a patchwork of appointments, lunches, consultant roles, NEDs. Leaves time for culture, for Aldenburg recitals, or performances by Tumani Diabate, or whatever it is that's printed on the ticket stub above the time, 7.30. Still ten minutes, plenty of time, it isn't far from the station. But as those hovering tiers of hammered concrete appear at the end of a long, doorless back street, you remember it being built, more or less, you think. You feel a slight unease, an uncertain memory, some anxious search, a sense of being lost. It's above you now, on top of the pitted ramparts that surround it. You skirt the wide, inviting ramp, which you learnt on another occasion leads only to a crypt-like car park, and mount a set of stairs somewhere beyond it. But where now? A wide expanse of maroon brick, the elephantine legs of the slab block, lights beginning to glimmer in the dusk in the deep recesses between the balconies. There's no one around. You have a memory that it's not the way you expect it to be. But what use is that? It's nearly time for the performance now. The lives of the people here are so mysterious, you think irritably, passing sunken light wells, a warren of what look like plastic igloos. Nothing in there, just dust. Do people live there? Is it left or right? Where's the centre? It's 7.30 already. You walk fast now, traversing the side of some vast courtyard under the belly of another concrete beast. 7.31. Water. It's near the water. And there it is. You cross the bridge at a full run. Fountains, spreading trees, cascading gardens, appearing and disappearing between the columns as they pass. You make it just. Your knee under your folded overcoat throbs for the length of the performance. You're listening to a podcast about buildings and cities. I'm Luke Jones. And I'm George Gingell. And we're talking about the Barbican Estate, a complex of buildings on the northern edge of the City of London, the historic and financial core of the city. Built on the largest bomb site in central London, the estate was already being planned during the latter years of the war. Construction eventually began in the mid-60s and was completed in the early 80s, but by which time the era which it represented was already starting to be dismantled. Its size and location make it a prominent representation of the style and approach to planning of the post-war welfare state period. There's a certain inevitability about how popular arguments about brutalism and modernism tend to circle back to the Barbican. So let's talk about it. The estate is conceived as a complete city quarter and as a consistent and unified material and aesthetic statement. Car-free and enclosed, the complex contains 2,000 flats, an art centre, concert hall, cinema, schools, gardens, shops, pubs, a tropical greenhouse, to name but a few. It's monumental, enormous and unusually coherent in the context of a city that's tended to escape planning or sweeping gestures. We gave you an initial idea of what it's like to visit in that sketch at the start of the programme, which is a caricature both of the experience of visiting it and also a flavour of some of the complaints that people have about it. George, it's one of the most recognisable buildings in London, but lots of people don't know it. So what is it like? Uh, The first thing you notice as you're approaching it is that um, it's like a massive wall. It's got all these public areas, but they're all three floors off the ground. So and no one ever goes on them, Um, which is so that's where all the sort of niceness is. So you're confronted with this big thing. It's very difficult to get a sense of it from the outside or even when you're walking around it as a concrete thing. But it's concrete, brown hammered broken concrete starkly modernist um it's when you when you have broken in it immediately you feel very disconnected to the city it's a very coherent large set of sort of there's these two courtyards and a lake with fountains and beautiful trees and you can't get around and there's lots of funny sort of corners and tropical greenhouses and funny shaped and buildings of very ambiguous purpose um which in it turns out contain things like schools and um abandoned conference centers and um things like that uh i'll probably do yeah it's incredibly stark 
it, the concrete. I don't think you can overstress how concrete it is. It's like gloriously and unashamedly concretey, and it's in a way that is very, very textural, very, very stark, and creates an overall sense of sort of sharp shadow and contrast. But it's definitely it's not at all the concrete of um, Tano Ando, or it's not crisp, ironed. It's hammered, smashed, curving. There's not that many right angles. Um, and there's certainly no sort of beautifully exposed shuttering or anything like that. It's um, concrete of a, of a bashed, ruined uh, hunk of stone. There's interior spaces that feel very much like they're carved out of rock. Um, and that's, I think, the, 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 the sort of aged sense that they were trying to create. Or timeless. Arguably one of the most unlikely things about it is that it came to be where it is. From the description we gave of the City of London as a historic core, you might assume that the impediment would be preservation, but that's not really it. The city, we're here talking about the City of London, uh, which is a sort of square mile in the centre of the larger metropolis of London, in its normal state is really a kind of zone of flux and repeated erasure of the past. Uh, It's a sort of privately funded free-for-all of development in which systematic planning really doesn't happen very much at all. And the only things which remain absolutely the same are the churches and the pattern of the streets. I think we need to make clear what the city is, what makes it unique, and the circumstances which allowed the Barbican to arise as this sort of exception to the norm. The city of London, only a combination of historic artefact and hyper-modernity is the very centre of the old city um, which is legally distinct from the 99% of London that surrounds it. Uh, It's a mixture of funny uniforms people with odd job titles and the fact that it's completely dominated in its management uh, by the huge financial corporations that occupy the area and it's a kind of legal oligarchy it is yeah it, it, uh, i mean literally controlled the the um electoral system which is very complicated uh and revolves around the idea that if you work there you get a vote but they're more or less all wielded by the employers rather than the workers themselves um has left it as a very peculiar thing so it sort of hides behind this legitimacy of lots of um history um and complicated dinners and stuff but essentially it's um the, the financial interests of the City of London have got their own little funny territory. They've got lots of money. They're in it for the long game. It's a weird extraterritorial sort of Vatican City in the middle of Yeah, the I was going to say Vatican City. And it means that they, they have this kind of operational independence and they have their own sort of set of interests, which they're able to pursue. Not, it's not like they can absolutely go their own way from the rest of the city, but it's slightly up to them what really happens yeah, they've got they're they're a bit like a sort of pot of money as well that can do stuff that other people, other bits of the city they don't have they don't really have anyone to look after. Basically, they've basically got no one living there. I mean, there are a few thousand people mainly in the Barbican Centre, um, uh, but they've got plenty of money. They're free from most of the sort of whims of party politics, um, and they're in it for the long game. They they do long term planning. The story of how this all comes about starts in the Second World War. Yes, the city of London was actually very heavily bombed. About two thirds of the area lost its roof, and there was a very hard strike um, right at the end of um, 1940, which burnt out the whole area north on the north side of the city of London and the bit beyond it, which had been um, a sort of mess of. Uh, mainly textiles warehouses, which burnt very merrily. They'd they'd, um, burnt down several times in history as well. Um, And that left the largest area in central London um, that was completely destroyed for all practical purposes. Um, A lot of it down to quite a long way below street level. There were lots of deep basements that were sort of illegally excavated and full of um, textiles. Um, So it's a really smashed, a bit of London that's not just smashed to the ground but smashed into it, a sort of nest of, you know, exposed underground railway and and, and broken buildings. And everyone saw, pretty much as soon as this happened, 
people started to see the potential of what they could build instead of you know everything else we're going to clear out those warehouses and we're going to build something really super fabulous yeah in fact such was the coalition of dreamers that um they almost immediately destroyed every bit of standing structure on the site as everyone was smacking their lips of what to sort of do next um and then argued for a very very long time yeah and the plans for the barbican uh quite quickly get enmeshed in a larger sort of quite ambitious plan covering the whole city which uh now almost all disappeared which were the famous high walks there was a notion at this time that it was a good thing now that we were letting the cars take over all the streets to have a new network of streets for people which was going to be light and airy and up in the air and we were going to lift all the sort of we were going to elegantly wander around suspended bridges and a sort of system that would go in and out of buildings around the whole historic center and people were busily planning this while the war was going on and there was going to be this system of routes more or less only one was well, sort of two one or two were started to be put into practice um and the last bits of them have more or less been torn down as of about last year um but you've got to imagine when people were planning this they were thinking in, in an almost utopian way about what they were going to do to this future city we've got all blown up europe and we're going to go towards a bright future uh and a big bit of that is going to be walking around two or three floors above ground level yeah so there's this idea of the network there's this futurism in the air and this futurism is very clearly apparent in the early designs which uh people come up with for the site there's two things that were evident which is that a lot of people wanted it to be new and part of this new utopian future and progress and also that the city is strongly historicist and thinks in long terms and has a real habit of and has got lots of old buildings and sort of very proud of that the other thing they determined very early on is they wanted it and this was very strange at the time to be residential They'd planned a whole load of more high-density office buildings. They were very worried that all the offices were getting old and knackered and no one would want to to, to reinvest in the City of London. Uh, But they also were beginning to have the idea, which I think is still very fashionable now and probably a good thing, that people should be near where they work. And there would be this fringe around the offices of high-density housing so that for the people who worked in the city. Oh, yeah. You don't want any, uh, like, big, cheap flats where people might have kids and things. Mm-hmm. They they get in the way so awfully. And also, they need schools and things. You want to really avoid any of that, unless they're for the odd... Um, yeah. Uh, I mean, so this is where we get into one of the... One of these... This is one of the oddities which is reveal, which reveals the status of the City of London, which is that it actually did build a lot of housing for uh, the working classes, but it built it way outside the actual city. Yeah, they were they were the first people to do social housing in in a sort of charmingly patronising way. They were sort of building, I think, really taking over from what the guilds had done. Yeah. So back in history, there'd be lots of these sort of arm houses out in the swampy fields of places like Shoreditch. Yes, and which, which um, were, were sort Morgate, of stra- strategies were... for keeping like old legless soldiers from begging all the yes, time. Yes, the uh, the worthy poor. Yes. <laughs> Uh, the worthy poor would be housed in sort of um, C-shaped uh, little communities on the outskirts. Yeah. In in very um, which are now plutocrat houses. Yeah. Um, in in a London, um, and but after that there was the sort of building of these high density blocks for all the cleaners and um, uh, office boys and uh, people who recycled the paper and stuff of the city of London. Yeah. Um, which are built further out. Yeah. So they would they would commute in, but. Uh, the kind of professional middle class sort of manager class they were allowed to live in the city proper or that was the that was the intention of what the barbican... that was the, that was the intention at the time of the barbican although before then they'd taken the the omnibus yeah i think we talked about uh the diary of a nobody before which is all about all the people who commute in yeah from places like putney yeah uh to work as clerks in the city yeah So the yeah, so some of the early schemes tend very sci-fi. Uh, there's a 1956 proposal by Gordon Cullen, which has this uh, pyramid-shaped greenhouse surrounded by 
uh, kind of bridges marching across a landscape and then ringed but at quite some distance by these long linear sort of slab uh, elements where all the flats are. There's a certain amount of um, tempering whatever the current state of theory regarding social housing with real high-grade megalomania. Yeah. Um, They're like big at this time. I think that there's also, um, there's this definite aspiration towards some kind of natural sublime in the middle of the dirty old city. Yeah, yeah. So we've Let's got, um, build sort of uh, super domes and ziggurats all over the place and have or have like a massive grid of little squares. Yeah, or the Hanging, the hanging Gardens of Babylon. There's hanging another one, there's another Rygate, one below yeah. here where you have this very high, high walk suspended on top of very tall legs marching across a sort of reed-like landscape which is then ringed by a sort of mixture of shops, uh, some quite strange kind of geometrical buildings apparently floating in the water off in the far distance. Yeah, yeah, you can see where a lot of the sort of ideas... It was all, it was all bubbling up. Yeah, it's definitely right that the, that the design is sort of oscillating between these poles of the future and the, and the past. Or yeah, like we haven't a, talked about... There were, there were some sort of quite... There were some sort of neo-castle proposals by yeah. some of the uh, people who'd been taught by the Victorians who hadn't died yet. They yeah. were still sort of banging around and thinking that maybe there was another there was another option for another wave of Gothic revival just around the corner. Yeah. Uh, so let's talk about the architects: Chamberlain, Powell, and Bon, or Bon, Chamberlain, and Powell. They, the the order of the name seems to switch around a little bit in the. Well, in I the think it's because Chamberlain, Powell, and Bon sounds best. Yeah. And Bon got them together, so he thought he probably should be. <laughs> they were three. They were three friends who got together after one of won a competition for a housing project actually on an adjacent site, Golden Lane. Uh, and we should, we should talk about Golden Lane briefly. Uh, the competition for what to go on that site is much more famous in slightly tired architectural theory terms than any of the stuff we're going to talk about. Yeah, or any of the stuff which actually got built, which is funny. Yeah, yeah. The, the people who built both Golden Lane and the Barbican were the compromise candidates between sort of high theory... And um, something a bit more believable. I think yeah. they were better at persuading. Yeah. I mean, the Golden Lane competition introduced this concept of streets in the sky, which is like a very, very resonant uh, concept, which would, sort of, would reappear in lots of other contemporary housing schemes. And sort of exists in the Barbican and then would go on and have a big afterlife. It's yeah. this idea that... Um, the, the the sort of commun the public spaces of the city become this sort of built spine on yeah. which you can hang things and this was a proposal by Allison and uh, Peter Smithson and yeah very famous but that's yeah. probably another very characteristically it combines these two things uh, this idea of like the space age in the sky with this actually largely imagined sort of nostalgia for the kind of classic working class yeah, yeah. street. All of these horrible slum streets have been blown up, so we can recreate them in slum streets in, in the, the sky. In slum streets in the sky, yeah. Ah, <laughs> oh, well. Um, and the graphics are the graphics of that sort of proposal are very amenable to close reading. Yeah, I mean, it's a, the whole actually the whole pr- proposal connects to all kinds of things. It arguably has quite a strong connection to early pop art which a lot of people really have... loads of graphics yeah. loads of sort of black and white dotty people cut out yeah. doing looking cool yeah. um in space environments we should try and describe what the estate is actually like uh, one of the difficulties of describing it is that it intentionally creates this very strong sense of variety as you move around both in terms of the actual buildings themselves what types of buildings they are what kind of how they are designed how they're positioned also the spaces between them are very very varied and have very different characteristics so that you often move up and down you go from hard landscapes to soft ones you go uh, to places which have water all these sorts of things it's higher on the outside and gradually sort of comes down into a lower area in the middle um the word i take out of that is gradually yeah well it's, no no it it's does, like it a does, massive wall but there are roots Depending on the route that you take, you may be at high level or at low level for greater or lesser amounts of time. There are routes which keep you at high level all the way through mm. the middle all of the of the low areas, uh, kind of as as you experience it. 
it's kind of part of the play of the circulation is whether you're at high or low level. Play, the, is a, play is a euphemistic word here. Well, it's one of the ways in which it's very easy to get lost is that you can, quite, you can quite easily make the wrong there's choice. There's a certain lack of like redundancy. Yeah, it's like so a, it's like a big wall. The, the, high, the, the kind of long linear slab blocks are also part of that wall, especially in a visual sense. And then in the centre, there's this lowered series of gardens around two mega courtyards containing uh, pool, fountains, a big cluster of cultural buildings. Um, And uh, on the northern side, there are these three massive towers, which were the largest residential towers in Europe when they were built. And are still actually pretty impressively large. Pretty big. 44 storeys is quite a lot for a tower block in London. Um, conceptually, it's quite similar to what we were describing with Golden Lane. Yeah, in that you've got um, private courtyards, more or less. There's a bit of public space around the art centre, which yeah. is where the sort of cafe is and things, which is on the lake. But the rest of the courtyards are private, and the public bit is raised up in this case. Yeah. So that the 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 way the slab blocks work is you've got a big block which is either a mixture of sort of car park and flats at the bottom and then yeah. a few floors up like three floors up it's a completely open deck which yeah. is the public bit there's a kind of big gap where where it's sort of studded with these enormous um uh kind of columns which are supporting the block above yeah more these, of these like ruinous kanga hammered yeah these are the feet. elephant legs of the uh, purple prose at the start and you yeah you look up and you can see into the glass bottom of some of the flats, which is a bit strange. Yeah, it feels yeah. a bit weird to be looking yeah. up into a glass window. And the bits that you're looking up into are like people's utility rooms. Yeah, you see a lot of underpants dry drying. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and then above that, there's, there's lots of layers of flats, which yeah. have got these, what, are, what they call shells on top. It's got yeah. arches. Yes, the, the, the penthouses on the top are, have these white vaulted uh, forms. So it yeah. looks like it's, it, it's this... It's quite attractive thing of like a, a tiny little building on top of the big building. Yeah, yeah, yeah with little patios which in turn yeah. have little sheds on them. Yeah, um, they were. Th- there's lots of trying to break up and yeah. stick together the block. So yeah. I think before this point, the first idea was you'd have blocks and towers yeah. with a mixture of sort of car parks and gardens around them, and you would almost get rid of all the urban spaces of streets and things like that. Yeah. Or put them inside the building, like in the Unite, where all the shops are inside the block in a little room. Yeah. Um, at this point, I think people were realising there were some problems with this. And so they're sort of trying to break up the block as in make it into several buildings at one level. So you've got the ground bit and then the raised up bit and the little bit on the roof. Yeah. But also join them all together and make a public space out of it. Yeah. So it, it's... In one sense, it's a mega structure. But it's a mega structure which kind of masquerades as a landscape with smaller buildings on top of it. Yeah, so part of the mega structure is this huge plinth, which yeah. has got objects scattered all over it. Some of which are pretty, they're even more cryptic now than they were then, because some of them are abandoned. Some of them don't really do anything. Yeah. Anyway, more of that later. Let's talk about how it was built, because it's a massive undertaking, and it took quite a lot of twists and turns during construction, some of which you can kind of still excavate and uh, uncover some of that history as well. Yeah, so the planning process. I know I'm leaping straight from the building to the planning, but I think a lot of the peculiarities of the building process are to do with peculiarities of the planning process. It went on for about 20 years, which is a long time. Um, and people kept sort of getting ideas. It's going to be paid for by the city, which has got, which is sort of a committee, really, and with lots of people on it. Yeah, who all sort of stick their oar in, and yeah. there were quite a lot of designers also involved at one stage or another, and it accretes lots and lots of, uh, like program like functions which people want to do. So it sort of becomes this thing into which you can throw all the bits and bobs the city wants to do. Yeah, let's let's talk about some of them. So it had it has like a a new art center with a theater, concert hall, cinema, library. But it also has these strange institutions which they just needed to find a place for, like the Guildhall School of Music. The City of London School for Girls, which got kicked out because they were selling off the site. Yeah. And they weren't really given any choice of where to put it. They had a big exhibition hall, in, uh, which is, I think, now... Conference Centre, which is now nothing, really. Yeah. Uh, the YMCA. 
Yeah, they wanted to uh, build student housing, which they turned into a YMCA, which is the, probably the grottiest bit of it, actually. Yeah. It's now being turned into flats. Um, a lot of, uh, Oh, a uh, tropical greenhouse yeah. on top of the fly tower. Yeah, some of these, I think, are kind of nice to have, but some of them are also kind of orphaned institutions, which they just needed to... Yeah, and there's literally some funny... Like the Ironmonger's Hall, there's this weird relic inside it. Yeah. Uh, Museum of London. Oh, yeah, the Museum of London. Yeah, shortly to be um, demolished. Shortly to be demolished. All the outer edges of it are going now. Yeah. And the core, because it's become this icon, is going to remain. So let's talk about the construction. They actually started building it without quite being certain what it was going to look like at the end. Partly because this was so fought over and argued, yeah. o- argued over. Um, they also didn't really... There's a lot of... Um, uh, Arab, the man himself, yeah, over Arab, the famous engineer. engineer, started a big company which is rolling on from strength to strength, um, had come up with lots of fairly ingenious ways of building these towers as this big prestigious project. Um, but that meant that the people who were building it really hadn't had any experience with a lot of the techniques they were using. Um, and it took a phenomenally long time to build as they sort of resolved these problems. Also because they kept getting strikes and running out of money and yeah. having arguments. They, um, the finish, which we see uh, now, which is created by... Um, casting like a little bit of extra concrete on the outside and then selectively bashing it off with a big pneumatic hammer uh, was only one of a whole series of finishes which they were considering. Um, And there's a place in one of the car parks where you can see the test areas of the various different options. Yeah, they're not very big. It's quite peculiar. I think actually um, the architects knew exactly what they wanted. They talked about it right at the beginning which is they wanted to be pin hammered with Welsh slate and acid etched. Yeah. So tortured concrete. Yeah. Um, but the city had sort of other ideas. So they tried out a few things like um, cladding it in marble. Yeah. Which would have been cheaper. Yeah, it's kind of amazing. But it also... Would have did, looked it, very ugly. It didn't look bits very of, nice. Yeah. Bits of the art centre. They're not... It's not sort of... um. Not beautiful big bits of marble, like little ba- marble bathroom tiles. Yeah. Um, which would have been strange. Yeah. Um, and other sorts of concrete finishes. And in fact, in reality, across the state, they use lots and lots of concrete finishes. I mean, the, the, the iconic one is so expensive because you have to cast this extra thing, put Welsh slate in it, and then get a guy with a massive pneumatic hammer to smash it back. Yeah. Which is a lot of work. It does also... It, it's actually very bad for the person doing the smashing because it gives them vibration white finger, like you get from chainsaw uh, overuse. Yeah, except you're chainsawing through concrete. Yeah. Um, it is also... We should say we've been describing it in these like potentially slightly ambiguous terms as ruinous and smashed, but it, it is also exquisite. Like, oh, it's, yeah, it's no, no, lovely. it's really lovely. There's a reason yeah. why they really wanted it. Yeah. Uh, and it has this wonderful, um, like, sort of softness of texture, and it gives you this... Inc- the play of light across it is really amazing. It looks like a piece of... Well, it doesn't look like... It has a lot of the feeling of a rock that has grown out of the ground mm. at, a, at the local level. When you're, when you're looking at it from a distance, it looks like architecture and planned. But up close, these huge you know, columns are like sort of bits of rock that kind of rise up. With a, It's weathered and rusticated and classical. Yeah. Um, but actually, there's lots, and lots and, there's lots and lots of different concrete finishes which are sort of different attempts to simulate that, depending on how close you get to look at them. So in lots of the bits that you don't... There's lots of nooks and crannies. Um, and in those, they would use increasingly cheap, yeah. simple concrete finishes. Um, there's lots of sort of there's a funny island with lots of pipes with water making waterfalls um, and lots of funny bits of sub car park and weird social snooker halls and things yeah which and as you get more obscure and less from the grand public spaces it's sort of it's sort of like the background of a set um, gets less and less uh, yes there's a definite there's a kind of entropic dynamic in the way in which it's been realized isn't it they they haven't been able to fully keep control of all of the elements all the way through 
there's so much stuff. And it was all planned in, it was all drawn up very much in plan. Yeah. Which accounts for how nuts it is and the how it just doesn't make any sense, a lot of the stuff. Because although there's the big core, which is these two courtyards, there's also loads of stuff going on around. Yeah. Which is just not worth describing because it's so complicated. There's like an old Gothic church in a sort of weird public area. There's bits that go off down long corridors with these sort of concrete barrel vaults, or, or barrel vaults over them. And you walk down and down and down. And then you're in another bit of the Barbican, which is like the Museum of London. Or more things that take you off to various tube stations and things. Yeah. So it was begun in 1965, and the first people moved in in sort of mid 70s. I think 72, 73. Yeah. And it was being built for another 10 years after that. Yeah. Um, although the last half of that really was just finishing off the art centre. This was very delayed. It didn't normally take people 20 years to build buildings back then. That was yeah. um, They kept encountering problems to do with things like it sinking into the ground or, or not ca- not being able to cast things properly. Yeah, I mean, the key thing is that the world has changed from post-war innocence to mid-70s nihilism. Yeah. Everything's got seedy and crap. Yeah. Yeah, it kicks off. It's like the Beatles help, white heat of the technological revolution, like optimism... And, and it finishes up with Susie Quattro and yeah. Clockwork Orange. Yeah, and Donny Osmond in the and charts. Donny Osmond. And dark clouds on the horizon, generally. Yeah. The oil crisis. Yeah. It's about to kick off. Yeah, yeah. We're about to have the worst bit of English post-war history. Like, punk is just round the corner. Unfortunately, we're still stuck in prog rock. <laughs> <laughs> And if anyone wants to know what the, the bar- really, <laughs> like, punk isn't the nihilistic uh, challenge to society and challenge to reality. It is it was prog rock that was the challenge to contemporary reality. That yeah. is a scream for help. Yeah. From a, from a world, from an unloving yeah. and cruel world. Psychic self-harm. Yeah. And... <laughs> <laughs> And uh, into this maelstrom pops. Yeah. Yes, on the Barbican estate, <laughs> the first um, residents, first units are coming are out. moving, and in. actually they've got a bit of a waiting list at first. Yeah. The first few years, uh, they sell like hotcakes. I've written a little story. Okay, roll on, Nigel Kane. <laughs> He modelled his style when he was younger, on Michael Caine in the Ipcris file. It was never quite there, more Nigel Caine than Michael. The glasses and suit nearly right, but just a little bit off, the sense of nervous embarrassment he can't get rid of. The flat's part of the package, part of the image, the low-lit carpeted hush of the lift lobby, the enormous silver lift button on a pedestal in the middle of the room like some pagan idol, and the views over the city over the river to the ragged brick margin, the derelict docks, the suburbs. Inside, it's a vision of the future. Breakfast in the seamless stainless steel kitchen, turning the wall-mounted spaceship knobs to warm up the Bialetti. The fridge effervescent with continental lager. TV sockets in every carpeted room. He's living the light, answering the phone in the bar, playing records out the sliding teak door into the dark. The city is as quiet as a library at weekends. From his bed, he can see the cold, blackened dome of St Paul's Cathedral. As a year and then another pass, the euphoria fades. Hungover, he watches terrapins scraping around in the heated pool of the conservatory. He gets hopelessly, mortifyingly lost, even in his own building. The waste disposal spits coffee grounds onto the ceiling with increasing regularity. The noise of construction grinding grimly on until it finally ends and in retirement still there he bitterly resents the passing of that glorious isolation as the garish new towers of a city awash with money gradually block out the old impeded vistas 
I mean, I can. I I, I lived in um, uh, Tower in the Barbican for a bit. Yes, Tell- and I can. T- <laughs> this is how you get in. So you go to Barbican Station. This is the the first story. I think is probably from Moorgate. Which is yeah, yeah, yeah. On the other side. You go to Barbican Station. Uh, you walk down this like sodium lit car tunnel because you don't want to climb up the steps and go onto the sort of lovely garden um, high walk because it takes a bit longer. So you go through this horrible without really a pavement, yeah, which is what everyone goes along. You come to my tower. There, someone will ask you, how do you get into the Barbican Centre? And you'll point to the little door behind the tower, which is the main entrance. <laughs> um... Uh, the entrance to my block of flats is bigger. You go in to this sort of big reception room with all its sort of like buzzer buttons and um, the guy to a darkened lobby, um, which is triangular. The walls, and very dark, the walls are of this like kanga hammered concrete. It feels like it's been cut out of the living rock. And there's in the dark and the gloom, this cylindrical downlighter spotting this brushed stainless steel plinth the circular plinth about sort of a meter and a half no a meter and 1.2 high um and it's got an illuminated button on it Mm. in the middle of this dark room this glowing stainless idol and the button calls the lift yeah uh and then you get in you go up into another one of these huge lobbies each of the lobbies there are three flats on each floor and the lobby is as big as the flats yeah it's amazing um, and there's also a huge and incredible um, escape stair, which you can look right up and down the whole core of the tower, and it's got these beautiful windows. The, sta- the escape stair is one of the most frightening spaces I've ever been in in my life. It's, it's like to Kiriko, except it's infinite. Yeah. Like, there's, it's got all these funny, it's a, it's going very around... sharp angles. We yeah, should put some pictures up. Yeah, the these blog. kind of triangular... It's so, it's so amazing. Yeah. It's all these... It's very frightening. Like, actually. weird barrel voltage cut... Like, the the barrels cut at an angle. Mm. I, I was you lodging with, how you came with to an be living elderly in the Barbican gentleman Center. who, who was uh, retired from his sort of semi-civil, semi-civil service job. Um, and had, when he retired, moved from his house in Richmond, um, in suburbia, into the Barbican on the 30th floor, and decked his Barbican flat out as if it was a suburban... Chintzy yeah. house um and had me as a lodger and he was yeah. moving in so that he could sort of enjoy the cultural life of the city yeah and he got in at just the right time because i think his flat's gone up by about eight times in value yeah in the 15 years he's been there um and yeah it's a rented room it was amazing yeah on very good terms yeah <laughs> which was lucky because otherwise there was no conceivable way i could have been there yeah um and the sense of being in those towers is amazing. You can understand yeah. why why um, why it is such a sort of. I mean, it, we were joking about urban elites living there. They really do, mm. like of all sorts. Um, I'm my brain is freezing. Who was the Union of Coal Miners? Oh, Arthur Scargill. Arthur Scargill still, and for his whole time as a prominent person, lived in the Barbican and yeah. still lives there. Yeah. Paid for by the... The National Union of Miners. Paid for by the National Union of Miners. Yeah. This is the phlegmatic, dogged, inflexible mine union leader who confronted Margaret Thatcher. Um, yeah. Uh, well, I wouldn't move out if I once once ensconced. No, and, um, you know, Adam Crusoe was like two floors below me. Mm. Crusoe St. John Architects. And um, lots of people. They were amazing, the people in there. Yeah. The balconies on those towers are really amazing because they, the kind it's it's as if the plane of the floor sort of curls rather lazily up to become the lip of the balcony, but it's very very like strong sort of sculptural feeling to it. Yeah, that's all the ra- racking resistance for the building is in that. Um, all the floors, all the walls are basically not structural. Mm. There are just like two columns or three yeah. columns. And they just take the loading, and then all the racking is done by making the balcony by like by by bending the floor plate up around the edges, like yeah. sort of folding a piece of paper to stop wow. it um, bending in the middle. Um, which was one of the sort of Arab yeah 
moves of genius that also com- enormously compounded the difficulty of the construction of the thing. Yeah. Um, well, I think you should tell some stories. I mean, tell about um, what was it like to live there? Oh, it's amazing. You're a kid in a playground. Um, a playground, a not designed playground, an incidental one. There's an awful lot of funny bits to explore, lots of subterranean car parks that have got sort of strange spaces between them. And there's like these weird little, there's all these weird little pubs which are slowly closing. Even more have gone than when I was there. Mm. Um, a little snooker hall underneath. And you you get this key. There are two interesting keys when you um, go in there. One of which is your door key. The deadlock door key is in the shape of a crenellated tower. The crenellations of which sort of encode. You don't lose them, though. In fact, no one uses them because if you lose them, they are so fantastically expensive to replace. <laughs> um, and and the one that lets you into all the private areas, which yeah. are almost completely unused, um, except very occasionally. Um, the sort of Super Mario land of pipes and tubes and waterfalls at one end. Um there's this conservatory. They didn't like the idea of a fly tower sticking out into their like public zone. So yeah. they covered it in a tropical pyramid. Um, so growing up the inside of this concrete tower, it's, there's, there's a glass pyramid, um, which is a complicated sort of hexagonal shape. Yes. Um, and on the inside, there's this big concrete tower which has got lots of tropical things growing up it. And there's an aviary full of tropical sung birds. And as you go up the levels on the outside of the tower, there's a sort of um, cactus zone and there's like a uh, uh, marine reptile. This is definitely, it's definitely the Barbican at its most sort of Logan's Run-esque, the, uh, the conservatory. It's lovely. It's hardly ever open. Well, it's open on Sundays. You should go there on Sundays. And they close it for weddings and things, but I haven't noticed what you have to do to get a wedding going on in yeah. there. Um, the art centre is kind of good on the inside, but it's like it, all of the insanity is escalated. Once The trouble with the first story you had is you didn't have the trouble that they would encounter as soon as they tried to get in, because yeah. they'd go in at a high level, and they would have to use at least three different staircases to get down yeah. to the concert hall. Yeah. Um, uh, it, it, it was very de- designed on a piece of paper. But it's amazing. It's got all these sort of cast bronze details and yeah, amazing. Everything. So all the light switches in the flats are like their own big metal trunk. Yeah, um, and your little desk lamp turns off. You know, one of the things which was stressed as an intention by the architects was this idea of urbanity. That this was urban rather than suburban, oh, which I think is extremely key to explaining some of the peculiar decisions yes and i think also although they never articulated it they're trying to address one of the big problems with modernist housing rather than the modernist house which is it internalizes into the building so you get these slab blocks or towers and the land between them is sort of nothing. What makes this place urban it, more than the buildings is the public space between them. It's the streets yeah, yeah. and roads where people meet, and the public buildings, which are w- what bring together the forces, was what makes something a city rather than a lot of people living in the same place. Yeah, absolutely. So the, uh, I think that the uh, the Barbican, because it spans this whole period from the forties to the seventies, it kind of internalizes this um, self-critical dialogue which is going on in architecture i think that the if you look at it in the context of the history of um sort of post-war modernist architecture in britain you can see lots and lots of things which happened previously which end up in it in one form or another sometimes as part of the kit of parts um sometimes as some sort of something which is repudiated or avoided yeah there are a lot of the late modern solutions the battle as which is still a battle going on today although it's become quite emasculated, the kind of the one that we were talking about is between modernist blocks and twee, mock, Georgian or Queen Anne houses of suburbia. Yeah. Um, and then the argument going on inside modernism 
is how to solve the problems of the block, I think. And yeah, how yeah, to yeah. get away from, which is... And that, I mean, that critique goes on in different ways. There's the critique of um, the modernist landscape as this, like, featureless green tabula rasa, with, which is just a sort of a, a space of kind of idealized, blah, idealized nature, but with nothing in it. Car parks, actually. Yeah. And, uh, you know, a good example of what this looks like is uh, an earlier um, development called Churchill Gardens, which was built in southwest London at the... Um, in the late 40s and it's it's the standard um all the blocks look like boxes of cereal on their side and there are like 30 of them and they sort of march across this flat landscape in a sort of offset grid that's basically it um and the i mean the the critique which emerges within modernism of these things is one partly which draws starts to draw on kind of historical archetypes real or imagined i mean, um, I, mean it's, well, I think the historical archetypes have been there right for, i think the historical the thing of using history to justify modernism is like the first but it's not thing to, it's not just does. to justify it it's actually no. to, it's actually to alter it yeah so that this the you know in the 60s people particularly people get really obsessed with the sort of density of italian hill towns or uh, yeah, the, the density or north african variegation soups. yeah um, and also the harshness of these urban spaces yeah. um, is used to sort of the hardness of dense old towns, which aren't that green and are tough and rigid. Yeah. It's funny, like, to hit, to, to read Chamberlain Palabon talking about the Golden Lane estate, which is much more conventional than Barbican. It's a grid of slab blocks, basically. Um, and they understand that as... Italian sunken gardens um and they talk about the fact that it's all grids and hard surfaces as being a bane yeah um as the thing that makes it not chintzy and the thing that makes it like urban living is that it's this gritty gridded tough yeah but I think you do I mean I think you see that so there is this critique of what you might call like modernist housing landscape but there's also a critique of the like modernist mass house, which is that um, in these kind of earlier, much more neutral archetypes, you know, the blocks marching across a landscape, the house is considered a place to live is almost a kind of neutral utility. You know, the house is a machine for machine living, living is like it's a it's a place to live and it doesn't really have any characteristics beyond fulfilling a certain set of material needs. And the critique which emerges is much more about this sort of variegation, individual identification, the sort of emotional qualities of home, and that sort of implied but specificity. Also, um, there's a problem that happens in architecture all the time, which is that architects think very much within the bounds of their brief. And yeah. The brief is the client, so if you're building a house, you're building a house. But if you're planning one of these sort of huge chunks of city, yeah, you really need to think about... Um, how you make city and the city isn't made of buildings it's made of yeah the spaces in between and uh the sort of density of you know public infrastructure and places for people to meet and when you're thinking inside a box the bit outside it i mean when i say think inside a box i mean literally in what what goes on inside in the unite which is le corbusier the sort of prototype for all of this stuff yeah um You've got a rectangle, an oblong box, sitting in a green car park, and the street is inside the tower. Yeah, and it's tiny, um, and it's not at all public. The tower isn't a, isn't a substitute for a city or a town or a neighbourhood. That would become very clear, I think, by this point. And they're trying to they're trying various solutions to try and bring the street into the building, but still have it be a proper street. And that bit of the Barbican didn't work either. It doesn't really work. No, the shop's all closed. The yeah. pubs kind of cling grimly to life. Um, it's because you have to go up three flights of stairs to go to a street when there's a street right there. I mean, is it a success or a failure? I kind of, I mean, it's. I think it's a terrific success. Yeah. But I think elements of it don't work, and I think we shouldn't 
gloss over how successful it is. It's very generous. Mm. Um, and although the shifting patterns of time and money have reduced some of the elements of the generosity, some of the public utilities have been sort of tightened down and closed down a bit. Yeah. Um, it's still very generous. And it's also at times beautiful. Yeah. And um, lovely and an oasis in terms of the residents bits are yeah. are you feel you're part of this massive landscape and it has a lot the, the experience of being there was very like for me like being a child wandering along rock pools and caves yeah. yeah and there are these sort of bits of stone and concrete that rise out of the ground which are sort of vents and bits leading into other bits um in the gardens and things which are really delightful and um as a gesture of uh, of sort of urbanity and order in a city which doesn't have a lot of that, I think it's very successful. But a lot of the rhetoric of what it was going to achieve hasn't worked. And yeah, I mean, for me, this distinction which they make between it being urban or suburban actually is a bit problematic because in terms of the mood of it, in terms of this sense of like there are these private gardens, it's monastic. It's not. Mon I mean, it feels suburban actually to me. I mean, it feels like an incredibly dense sort of suburbia that it has this like total respectability. It has except this that. kind of semi-privatized quality to the to the spaces. It's sort of landscaped. It's manicured. It's incredibly peaceful. There's almost nothing going on. I, but I think it's more collegiate or monastic. Um, although it's got those things that are suburban, yeah. but it also has things that are very not suburban. The it's way like, it's in an which... inner it's an inner city suburb. You think so? I f I feel like it's got a big suburban quality to it in the end. Like you have to you have to go miles away to go and do any shopping. No, you don't. You have to go <laughs> just across the road to the massive Waitrose, which is like the next <laughs> building. But you have to actually leave it. You have to leave it yeah. to do shopping. Yeah. You have to leave the compound. It's extremely compoundy. Yeah. It's like a sort of nice armoured expat suburb. Yeah. Of, um, are, it, it, I think maybe what it is is that it feels like it's a bit of the city where you don't have to make any of the compromises of living in the city. Like, you know, you get the excitement, you get the thrill, you get the edge, you get the places to go out, and you also get, like, the per pervasive scent of urine... The sort of slight danger, people screaming outside your house, all this kind of stuff. It feels like the Barbican. You can, you can have both, but actually you sort of have neither. I think there are more. There's more than one way to be a bane. Yeah. <laughs> um. It's it's not like. It's not like the warehouses it replaced, and it's not like the slum streets that people wanted to turn into streets in the sky. But it wasn't trying to be like that. It was trying to be like... It's trying to be like um, Georgian squares, I think, or something like that, where the thing is... Pri the square is private, and you need a key to get in. And it's quiet yeah. and prosperous. And it's trying to be like that, but a bit cheaper. Yeah. And a bit more egalitarian. Yeah. And I think those things are extremely urban... They're just not the urban that we live in, which is the sort of East London yeah. uh, skinny latte uh, fights, mix, uh, um, uh, like working class immigrant and Cockney being displaced by tech hipster yeah. and sourdough pizza dynamic. It's not that urban. No. <laughs> but to say that the urban urbanity of squares and seasons and that sort of thing isn't urban, I think isn't true. It's not, it's not a suburban form. Um, I don't think. Because it's a place where your work and life is lived in a small, dense area with lots of people interchanging and rubbing up against each other very near. Yeah. Um, and um, it's a place where a large number of people mix and it's got a community to it. If I mean, another sense in which it seemed that you were saying it's not urban as it's... Is it's sort of disunited or alienated which i think is the opposite of what it's like it's like um 
like you say hello to each other in the lift in a way that is extremely uncharacteristic of London. Yeah, yeah. One of the things which we mentioned briefly at the start is the style. This style has a name. It's called brutalism, which is widely misunderstood term. It's invented by a guy called Rainer Bannum, who's an architectural critic of the sort of 60s and 70s, who was an intellectual and a man with a highly developed sense of irony uh, <laughs> in a country which has been quite resistant to both of those <laughs> things. Uh, oh, irony um, comes in and out of fashion. Intellectualism yeah. is always out of fashion. Yeah. So what, one of the things about the Barbican is that although it's a very unique project in lots of ways, it's actually related to a whole series of other buildings which were being built just before or at the same time, which share these qualities of like it's very very str- like concrete a kind of unashamed concrete concreteness yeah. um a belief in the sort of sculptural and dramatic potential of repeated uh elements a belief that something large and modern can be urban yeah. as well and can be central which is the economist building the brunswick but no. the barbican is it stands apart, rather like it stands apart from the city around it. It stands somewhat apart from these because it's so big and particular and can dominate its surroundings and had so much time and so much freedom. It's never been embattled in the same way that a lot of other buildings, which are kind of arguably its, its sort of cousins, have been. Yeah, it's never been anywhere near threatened with demolition. Yeah. It was once plausible that the Brunswick would be knocked down. Yeah. There's n- never been approaching plausible that you would knock down the Barbican. Yeah. Whereas a lot of the, I mean, actually, the kind of great works of that period are fast vanishing. The Tricorn Centre in uh, Plymouth is gone. The, I, had uh, a man, I had a man on my tour yesterday who said he moved out of Plymouth because the Tricorn Centre was there. Oh, really? Yeah, yeah. All of these buildings have startling levels of opposition. They do, among, like, Baby boomers among yeah, like yeah, yeah. Brexit, yeah, Brexit, Brexit fucking people, Brexit baby boomers, yeah, yeah. If we just could, if they could just get to the next generation, they would be saved. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We just need we're just a few cold winters yeah. and unstaffed care homes away from liberty. <laughs> yes, the boot will be on the other foot. We'll be living in the now valueless houses. Uh yeah, but the kids. They've grown up soft. No, it's okay. We can, uh, we can them whip up. them into action. We can toughen them up. <laughs> I'm not sure we're going to disclose the full urban malicious proposal at this stage, actually. No, no, we'll, no, uh, no, we'll no. Be... Also, also, don't you know the first rule of survivalism? You must hide. Yes. You must hide your strength. <laughs> but None brut- of those buried caches will ever be discovered. <laughs> yeah. But brutalism as a style is basically embattled... There are like a few examples, and the Brunswick is one, the Alexandra Road flats in Camden are another, where it, they've, it's been able to become sort of fully embedded, accepted, and kind of celebrated. Establishment. Yeah, and it's because like very wealthy and respectable people live there. Because there are a certain number of wealthy and respectable people who are, are, are sort of identify with the progressive aesthetic and yeah. want, want to be urban and live in flats and central. Yeah. But they are not at all the, the the masses that were meant to be saved from urban squalor. No. And in a way, this is kind of the tragedy of the Barbican is it's, you know, it's kind of style without substance in that way. Like, it's wearing the clothes of this massive sort of progressive movement, but without ever having had That's anything a, to do with it's it. Not, it's not at all... It's not at all socialist. Yeah. It's very conservative. One of the things which is funny about it is it reveals the sort of ubiquity and strength of that, like, interwar soft socialist project at that time. That even the City of London, which was always this arch-capitalist kind of uh, financial elite kind of oligarchy, felt that it had to adopt that style and those clothes for whatever it was going to build. But if you think of the buildings that stand out from that period in the city and around the city, they are in this sort of late developed wealthy modernist style. Yeah. Um, and would continue to be 
up until sort of 82, 83, when things start kicking into postmodern. What do you think of what it now is? So it's this kind of unfelt relic. I think it's got no revolutionary potential. No. Even now, though, it is kind of crystallising more and more as a historical artefact. Yeah. Um, as something like a Georgian square. The, its tentacles are being slowly chopped off one after another. The yeah. get High Walk has gone. The Museum of London is going to go. The High Walks generally have gone. Um, its place as a dominant tall thing is sort of disappearing. Um, and it's crystallising as something that's even more separate from an age. When it was built, it was part of a pattern. Now it's a little moment. Yeah. It's a little, it's a little sort of inclusion. In its own lifetime, it's kind of a historical piece. Late, mid-20th century. Something that is really sad is that institutions haven't really done anything afterwards. It's hard to see how historical it is when there's been nothing subsequent. What do we have now? The Millennium Dome? Yeah, that's it, basically. It's definitely right at the end of a period when people built amazing things. Yeah, the redoing. There was a heroic age of construction of civic, public spaces. London's only really had two. It had the sort of mid-19th century, where where they were driving roads through, building huge train stations and huge chunks of city were being demolished and rebuilt, and the post-war. I think that the revolutionary potential of the Barbican is that you can kind of look at it and look prospectively towards whatever the next one is. So if the first big wave of building was like 1840s to 1880s, and the second big was 1940s to 1970s, yeah. do we really have to wait another 20 years? Possibly, yeah. <laughs> yeah, 20, 30 years. I think we might just be becoming successful at that point. Will there ever be such a heroic age again? Oh, yeah. But possibly not on this We plan. might have to die for it. Yeah. <laughs> On which note, goodbye.